Welcome everyone to this third and final seminar in our series looking at key themes in minority rights protection and in support of the UN Forum on Minority Issues and the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. My name is Dr. Kareen Lennox and I'm a Senior Lecturer in Human Rights at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London. And I'm very pleased to be the moderator for this session, which is entitled The Interrelationship Between Conflicts minority rights, and the promotion of inclusiveness and stability. I welcome you on behalf of the University of London and our co-hosts and organizers, the Tom Lantos Institute. Today, we have five excellent speakers for you who will discuss various countries' examples and some general recommendations on the role of minority rights protection in conflict prevention and resolution. This is really a vital topic for us to include in our webinar series, and it will also be the focus of a future session of the Forum on Minority Issues in 2021. Violations of minority rights, such as inequality, exclusion, and various forms of injustice can lead to tensions and even conflicts. But equally, minority groups have been targeted by the state and other groups who are using violence and conflict to further exclude minorities. And in both cases, the protection of minority rights can serve to bring stability, inclusivity, and justice. To explore these issues, we will start with presentations from each speaker of about 10 minutes, followed by some summary remarks from the Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, Dr. Fernando Varen. Our distinguished speakers today are as follows. Mr. Paul Simo, who is a barrister at the Center for Law and Public Policy, a policy and advocacy organization in Cameroon, and he will speak to the case of Cameroon. Uh, Esther Ojolari, who is a doctoral candidate at the School of Advanced Study at the University of London, and also works with the Consultoria para los Derechos Humanos y el Desplazamiento, also known as CODES, which is a conflict prevention and human rights organization in Colombia, and she will speak to the Colombian case. We will also be joined then by Dan and Bien, who's from Kachinland College, and he will speak to the case of Myanmar, and particularly Kachin State. Then we will hear from Ambassador Lamberto Zanye, who is the OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities since July 2017, and who will offer some reflections from his mandate. And we will conclude with further comments from Fernanda Varen, Dr. Fernanda Varen, the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. We are also very pleased to have inputs from you, our global audience, and we invite you to submit comments and questions to our speakers in the chat box. They will be able to see your, your questions and they will be uh, shared not only with our speakers today, but also with the mandates of the OSC High Commissioner on National Minorities and the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. For those questions that we don't get a chance to address in the limited time we have today, the information and concerns you raise will be passed on to those two authorities. We will start our speaker, our first speaker will be uh, Mr. Paul Simo, followed by Ms. Ojolari, Mr. Nbien, Ambassador Zanye and Fernanda Varend. We will then have uh, some questions from you, the audience, and some closing remarks. Now, our first three speakers have been invited to prepare comments to two specific questions. And we are imagining now that we are transported to the UN Forum on Minority Issues, where minority groups come from around the world to raise issues of concern and, and, and to be heard by states and other actors. So we have challenged our speakers to answer these two questions. Assuming that you are at a virtual meeting of the UN Forum on Minority Issues, if you're making your intervention now, what are three key issues that you would raise on this country's situation? And having made your intervention to the UN Forum on Minority Issues, what actions would you like to see the international organizations do to address the concerns that you have raised? So with that, I would like to invite our first speaker, Mr. Paul Simo, to give his response. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, moderator. Um, my remarks are in two parts. First of all, I'll very quickly situate the minority situation and conflict in Cameroon rapidly. And then I'll address a sort of combi a combined response to the two, to the two part uh, test we were given. 
by essentially pointing out three things that international uh, organizations and institutions should be doing better in these situations of minority conflict. So to basically situate what's going on in Cameroon, the minority we're referring to um, would for most purposes be defined on a language or a linguistic systems basis as English speaking and French speaking. Um, for the last four years, there's been a crisis going on which has morphed into a conflict and it's relatively well documented. I won't speak too much about that. Um, the principal characteristics that differentiate this minority group uh, tend to revolve around use of an official language, English versus French, use of different educational system, use of a different justice system, but also differences in modes of governance. So French system that tends to rely a bit more on appointments versus a system that uh, depends a lot more on elected officials. So on all of these issues, educational system, official language, justice, and so on, um, the English speaking community tends to be very centrifugal. They do not want the central level authorities managing these issues. They, they tend to want greater group autonomy in managing these different areas. Um, and so it's also worth noting that it's a relatively territorially concentrated minority, meaning that um, the people are in two regions of the country, so in a geographically identifiable area. And research tends to show that those types of minority situations can boil into political conflict because the group is territorially concentrated. It's also a situation where the government is weary about the distinction between Anglophone and Francophone and tends to say that, well, everyone is Cameroonian and that's uh, basically, what the minority self identifies as its distinguishing characteristic is something which formal or official state policy uh, considers to be a bit embarrassing. Um, and so we're, we're in that bind and, and the conflict, um, the crisis has morphed into a conflict over the last four years. So what are the three key things that we'd like to point out um, which international organizations need to do much better uh, in such situations? The first is that Cameroon is a relatively open, accessible country. It's not a place to which internationals and so on have not had access. Um, the World Bank's current country loan portfolio is $2 billion. The African Development Bank, you know, close to 1.8 billion US dollars. Cameroon has a large United Nations country presence as well. Um, but the one thing that one notices is that despite all the standards and reminders and the publications and mandates that exist on this issue, um, some of these institutions, uh, international development banks, uh, international agencies, they are still missing some of these minority situations. That is, it, it doesn't come up in their analytical radar as they engage the country. The example I will use is that this Cameroon's present Anglophone crisis began in 2016. If you go and look at the World Bank Country Assistance Strategy for Cameroon, if you look at the United Nations Development Assistance Framework for Cameroon, if you look at the Cameroon government's own uh, sort of five or 10 year development and policy planning instrument, nobody mentioned this as a potential problem. Um, and that looks surprising. And you say, well, but is this a new issue? Well, it's not. There's extensive research over the last 25, 30 years, academic, demographic, and so on, which showed that this problem was there. It just was not making it sufficiently to the top. So that's the first issue. Um, it, it really looks like a terrible miss. How could a country in which there's a large international presence and so on, how could such a country be unable to pick up? Uh, how, could, how could it be, uh, you know, the partners be unable to pick up these issues? And on this point, we just also should say that it cannot be left to governments to put this on the agenda because national policy is itself conflicted. National policy would sort of wish away the existence of that minority distinction. So these international institutions have to be more alert, more astute in putting these issues into their agenda in policy dialogue with governments on a regular basis. Otherwise you run into the embarrassment that even your own core strategy documents show a misreading of the country's context. So that's point number one. Second point we'd like to raise um, is the question of sectoral misses. So this is when you have international institutions and agencies that are actually working in specific sectors and are essentially supposed to be doing good, development good in those sectors. But those are sectors which have a disproportionately negative impact on, on minority communities or groups. And where again, 
you look in the programming and you see that there's just a miss. So the issue didn't come up. Two examples I'll cite. One is in the education sector. It's a sector the World Bank, for instance, has become recently uh, heavily engaged in in Cameroon with hundreds of millions of dollar agreement with the government, which if you look at the objectives from a purely national standpoint, there are a lot of objectives. It's you know, increasing girls' access to education, increasing school completion rates and so on. But at, the, at a time when Cameroon itself is going through a real crisis in the education sector where schools have been burnt down, anglophone uh, education unions have been harassed, have been in very difficult policy space. Children, lots of children have had to miss school because of a, of a school strike that was at the start of this crisis. The said program, so it's, it's a good program overall when you read it from a broad national perspective, but it doesn't speak to the fact that there was a minority community having a real crisis in its education sector. So that's an example of a sectoral miss. Another example of a sectoral miss is the justice sector. Again, it's a contentious domain because the Anglophone and Francophone trained legal practitioners view their roles differently and view their systems as different. Again, we have the European Union and others who engage the justice system with what are unobjectionable objectives uh, from, an, from a sort of countrywide perspective. But again, they pay no attention to this as a potential conflict trigger. Um, an example is, you know, if you read Cameroon's justice sector strategy, five or 10 year justice sector strategy, it doesn't even mention the issue as a constraint. So, so that's the problem. The, the problem is that, you know, you're, you're, you're not even picked up. Uh, it, it doesn't even get picked up on the radar. And so we, can expect, we can't expect much in terms of a policy response. The third and last uh, area where I would um, propose that international actors need to look very carefully is the question of a, there's a physical and a spatial disconnect between a lot of these, uh, a lot of the key international actors. And so we're talking the bilaterals in terms of embassies. We're talking multilateral development banks, World Bank, regional development banks. We're talking the United Nations system. They often have a spatial and physical disconnect with minority communities, in particular if those minority communities are territorially concentrated because international institutions come in through the capital. And so that's where necessarily they're building a lot of connections and they're building most of their contacts. Um, and in many of these situations where you have a minority or groups that are seeking you know, greater autonomy and so forth, um, they, they are not operating at the center of the national policy space. They're operating on its periphery. And so if, you inter if the international actors are very heavily leveraged at the center, um, they, they, they don't, I mean, you know, they don't have enough proximity to the issues that the people in the periphery are raising. And it's even, you know, in the study of decentralization and devolution processes in, in political science, people say it's the same thing. International actors have a hard time because you have, let's say, local communities, municipalities are trying to extract greater power from the center, but you are almost, you know, compounding the problem by, because you're reinforcing the resources at the center. Whereas really what you need to be doing is helping these societies attend to the needs of people who are at their periphery. So in this last area, we would really recommend that you know, international institutions need to be sensitive to this. They need to ensure that their network of national contacts, their geographic presence, even within countries, has to be of a nature that allows all of these uh, minority um, voices to, to come to the fore. So with that, I'll, I'll end my remarks and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. That was uh, three very sharp points. And uh, I appreciate, in particular, your reminder to international organizations of their responsibilities for due diligence to look at the impact of their interventions on minorities and to do the kind of outreach that you just called for, particularly in your final point. Thank you. Uh, I'd like now to invite Ms. Ojalarly to present on the Colombian case, please. Um, hi, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this space. So I'm going to speak specifically on the situation of um, Afro-descendant people in the context of the armed conflict in Colombia. And much of the information and arguments that I'll make today are based on ongoing work, activism work and accompaniment work uh, with local organizations, including PCN, which is the Black Communities Process, uh, COMPA, which is the Af National Afro-Colombian Peace Council, and the Ethnic Commission for Peace and Defense of Territorial Rights. Um, 
So the, the first point I want to make today about the armed conflict in Colombia is the importance of understanding and really highlighting the role of racism as an underlying factor in the armed conflict. So the internal armed conflict in Colombia is not what we may call a, an ethnic conflict in that ethnic minority groups are not active parts of the conflict in any way. While there have been people from various ethnic minority groups in the ranks of different armed groups, and of course in the, um, in the military, none of the armed groups or none of the parties of the conflict actually represent the interests of ethnic groups or the needs of ethnic groups. And actually, um, on the contrary, Afro-descendant and indigenous peoples have been victims of human rights violations by all parties to the group, so the FARC, the ELN, paramilitaries, other dissident groups, and of course the armed forces of the state as well. So rather than an ethnic conflict, it's, it's a conflict between state and, and various armed groups of different ideological, political and economic interests, where Afro-descendant and indigenous peoples are essentially caught in the crossfire. Um, having said that, it's fundamental to, uh, for us to understand and use understand this conflict from an, what we call an ethno-racial perspective. Um, and that is looking including at the role that structural, institutional and environmental racism have played in, in the conflict. So um, first of all, Afro-descendant people are disproportionately and differentially impacted by the armed conflict in Colombia. Um, the conflict is about very much about e economic interests, resources, territorial control, and much of the actual fighting and clashes have taken place in the ancestral lands and territories of Afro-descendant communities. Um, so we see an over-representation of Afro-descendant people among the victims of the armed conflict. Um, this hasn't changed since the signing of the peace agreement between the FARC and the government um, in 2016. So since 2016, uh, CODIS, the organization that I work for, has recorded 406 um, deaths or, or killings of 468 social leaders, 15% of whom are Afro-descendants. We've recorded that 43% of aggressions and threats and other attacks against social leaders um, are against those belonging to ethnic groups. 45.7% um, of displaced populations since the signing of the agreement are also ethnic groups. Um, and in Buenaventura, where I work, we've seen since the signing of the peace agreement, um, 13 mass displacements um, involving a total of nearly 7,000 people. Um, and Buenaventura is a territory that is majority Afro-descendant. But as well as a disproportionate impact, we see a differential impact of the armed conflict on Afro-descendant communities. So the conflict has led to the destruction of traditional cultural practices, livelihoods, uh, relationships with territory, organizational processes, and widespread violation of constitutionally recognized ethno-territorial rights. Um, so Afro-descendant people are not just individual victims of the armed conflict, but they form a collective victim of the armed conflict and they recognize as such. To understand racism as underlying all of this, it's important to understand the conflict as a, as a legacy of colonialism and enslavement. Um, so since the end of enslavement and, and due to ongoing structural racism in Colombia, the territories of Afro-Colombian communities have been essentially abandoned by the government with lack of investment, lack of infrastructure, lack of services, um, widespread violations of basic economic, social and cultural rights and lack of protect protection. So many cite that when the armed conflict arrived in those territories, they were already in a vulnerable um, position and situation. Yeah, with wide poverty, um, you know, lack of basic needs. But we must also understand the armed conflict as a continuation in a way of the colonial paradigm in which rights violations against Afro-descendant and indigenous peoples, this also applies to indigenous peoples, are underpinned by the same colonial ideologies of racism, patriarchy and capitalism that have driven continuous forms of violence against black bodies um, and put private economic interests above the lives and the rights of black people since the colonial period. So in the context of this contemporary armed conflict, we see uh, economic exploitation um, in illegal ex economic activities, such as mining um, or drugs trafficking. We see recruitment and use of children of young people and young people into armed groups, um, sexual violence against women and girls of African descent, forced displacement from ancestral lands. And those lands are of, as I mentioned before, of economic interest not just to illegal armed groups, but to the state and private actors, legal private actors, um, and forced disappearances, tortures, and killings of leaders that are brave enough to speak out against 
um, the actions of armed groups, but also against the prevailing neoliberal economic model. So all of these we see as a continuation of violence since the colonial period that has morphed and changed, but essentially um, operates under the same under the same ideologies. And, all, and we also see environmental racism. So ancestral territories themselves have suffered damage through com combats, um, aerial spraying of glyphosate, use of anti-personal mines, and the expansion of uh, extractivist projects and infrastructure projects, violating environmental and cultural rights of Afro-descendant communities. Um, and institutional racism is one of the main factors in the Afro-descendant victims who are victims of the conflict have not received adequate protection, assistance, or reparation. Um, and so this denial of access to justice for victims is also something that we see as part of the dehumanization of Afro-descendant people. Um, important to mention as well, and we can perhaps talk about this later, but the pandemic has further deepened, the, the COVID pandemic has further deepened these structural inequalities and left communities even more exposed to the ongoing armed conflict. The, the second point I want to make is around uh, Afro-descendant women and the importance of an intersexual gendered um, understanding of this armed conflict. Afro-descendant women have been disproportionate victims of sexual and gender-based gender violence, um, often underpinned by uh, racist colonial stereotypes of black women. So the hypersexualization, the objectification and the dehumanization of black women, um, which parallel uh, you know, the sexual violence suffered by um, their ancestors during the period of slavery. Sexual violence, femicide, and other forms of gender-based violence are shown to be, and have been shown to be by black organizations and black activists, um, a deliberate strategy of war for territorial control. So women's bodies are seen as territories of war. Afro-descendant women are often direct objects of aggression. Um, and this is linked to the fundamental role that they pay, play in their communities in maintaining and transferring traditional cultural practices uh, identity and, rep and also representing and promoting an alternative to the neoliberal model, all of which is seen as resistance for communities. It's a way of communities being able to resist the onslaught of all of this modernity, if you like. And so female social leaders, but also traditional midwives, traditional medicine practitioners and others are seen as posing a threat both to the economic agenda and the agenda of territorial control of these armed groups. And as such, they are targeted um, by all forms of violence and also often stigmatized and criminalized even when they're not necessarily activists. Um, the third point then I want to make is about the importance of participation of minority groups in, um, in peace building and in transitional justice. So Afro-descendant activists have been fundamental in visibilizing um, and articulating these dynamics of the armed conflict in Colombia through national and international advocacy and human rights work, presenting in re endless reports to the, um, to the CERD, to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, and despite being excluded from the initial peace talks in Havana, through the creation and the articulation with indigenous peoples, they created the Ethnic Commission for Peace and Defense of Territorial Rights and achieved the inclusion of an ethnic chapter in the peace agreement. Now this chap ethnic chapter in the peace agreement is really a historic move for, his for transitional justice. It recognizes the racialized and gendered um, nature of the armed conflict. It recognizes the colonial roots and the structural dynamics of the armed conflict. And it creates safeguards for the ethno-territorial rights of, eth of ethnic peoples through the implementation of the peace agreement. So there was a real concern that the implementation of the peace agreement might roll back already existing ethno-territorial and collective rights. It also creates important conditions for participation in all elements of the, of the implementation of the peace agreement, including free prior informed consent for ethnic communities. Um, and it requires an ethnic approach essentially to, to the implementation. However, as we've seen, as the armed conflict has actually deepened and worsened in territory since the, um, since the signing of the, of the peace agreement, um, it's essential that this ethnic chapter is actually honored and implemented. But according to those monitoring the, the various indicators of the um, ethnic chapter, only 7% of these indicators have actually been implemented. And these are very much the kind of initial ground laying elements. So what we see is still a lack of guarantees of security protection and guarantees of non-repetition in the territories, the armed group, the, the conflict continues. There's been a reconfiguration of the conflict since the FARC have left territories. Um, we're seeing rollbacks in, in already recognized ethno-territorial rights, including the right to free prior informed consent, 
uh, we're seeing systematic uh, political exclusion and institutional discrimination. So African descendant peoples are not being invited to the table as they should be um, around all of these elements of implementation. And then of course, we're always seeing, as we often see, low capacity, institutional capacity um, and lack of sufficient resources to actually make many of these measures happen. So in terms of kind of key demands and asks of the international community, the first ask, and this is what always is on the table, is the importance of really um, driving home and insisting and, and pushing the Colombian government to honor the agreements that it's already made. Colombia is very well known for having signed up to most or if not all human rights international treaties. It has some of the most progressive human rights law and transitional justice law probably in the world. But in terms of implementation, it's, it's extremely lacking. So the ethnic chapter um, must be implemented, but also existing um, ethno collective rights that are recognized in constitutional law around collective reparation, that's absolutely essential as a guarantee of non repetition of the armed conflict and rights to free prior informed consent. Um, we need to see more pressure from the international community around the advance and the dialogues with the ELN, which have, um, you know, faced various different difficulties over the years. Um, they are, you know, there have been talks going on in Havana, but then they were lifted and then there was a ceasefire again. I think they declared a ceasefire uh, or the idea of a ceasefire the other day. But what we need is a definitive ceasefire and end to hostilities against the civilian population. And related to that is support, international support for what is called the Acuerdo Humanitario, with Acuerdo Humanitario Ya which is um, an, a, an organizational proposal from ethnic organizations in the Choco, but also reaching out to the rest of the Pacific region where, where, I'm, where most of what I'm talking about is taking place, um, to, to demand uh, the government and the ELN put in place humanitarian measures to end the grave impact of the conflict on the communities and the region um, and preserve the lives of those communities. I think also, um, more uh, support towards the what is the Guardia Cimarona and the Guardia Indígena. These are community based mechanisms from ethnic groups for own protection, self care and safeguarding of lives, particularly with a focus on on women and children. And these these groups are essential for, for feelings of security within the communities. Um, the Ombudsman's office in Colombia has an early warning sign around uh, human rights violations in the territories, which is very important for identifying um, actions that have taken place within the armed conflict. But that system needs to be um, developed and strengthened, particularly in terms of then follow up on those early warnings and also some kind of support to community based early warning systems as well. Um, I think and I would love to promote and say that the ethnic commission that I mentioned earlier, the ethnic commission um, for peace and defense of territorial rights, which was formed in 2016 between Afro descendant and indigenous communities and it's that organization that achieved the ethnic chapter must be recognized and positioned as a leading international authority on uh, issues of conflict peace and ethnic peoples because they've really done some groundbreaking work around um, transitional justice and peace building. And finally, we see that the, the Security Council Resolution 1325 has played a really important role for gendered approaches to public policy in um, conflicts and transitional justice. And we would recommend that the Security Council adopts a similar resolution around ethnic people's peace and security. Um, so thank you very much and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much, Esther. It's a, a very important case and you've given us a very rich picture of what's happening there and, and the innovation and agency of Afro-Colombian communities to, to challenge what has been the impact of the conflict on them. And I like particularly you've given us the long view to understand the structural inequalities that existed prior to the conflict and how that made uh, Afro-Colombians more vulnerable. Uh, and also thank you very much for raising the perspective of, of women in the conflict as well and their experiences, that's appreciated. Now I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Dan and Bien to share with us uh, the perspective from Kachin State. Please, Dan. Thank you to Tom Lentos Institute and School of Advanced Study. Hello, everyone. I'm from Kachin community in northern Myanmar, which is sandwiched between China and India. So as you all know, Myanmar is a country with the longest ongoing civil war in the world and currently on Rohingya genocide trial at the, at the International Court of Justice. Since the country became independent from the British colonial rule in 1948, 
the majority Burman authorities have conflicts with multiple ethnic political movement and their armed wings. For this presentation, I would like to present the Kachin situation as a case study of the interrelation between minority rights and conflict in Myanmar. So Kachin, Kachin community. Kachin is a community of people who speak different languages and dialects, but they share the same similar culture and kinship system. So Kachin community inhabited in Kachin, Shan State in Myanmar, Yunnan province in China, Assam and Arunachal Pradesh in India. The Kachin community has been living in this area since time immemorial. Just because of the border demarcations, the populations were divided into three countries. As of now, the total population of Kachin community is less than 2 million. So we can say the minority in terms of numbers in all three countries. So a large number of Kachin population at Kachin stake in Myanmar and Kachin are considered as the founding member of the Union of Burma. So when it comes to the challenges that Kachin and other minority communities in Myanmar are facing, that firstly, I would like to point out the, the original sin of not keeping the promise of the founding social contract of the Union of Burma. In 1947, the Panglong Agreement, the social contract between Burma proper and ethnic nationalities to form the Union of Burma was signed based on the principle of equal rights and self-determination. However, since the first Constituent Assembly in 1947, that wrote the Constitution of the Union, the founding principles were undermined. The ethnic states, they did not receive, they did not have any power to control their own affairs and resources as promised in the social contract. During the parliamentary democracy period, territories in Kachin state were transferred to China without the consent of the people in the state. And Buddhism, Buddhism was institutionalized as the state religion. So to please the majority population in the country. So that make non-Buddhist citizens into second-class citizen. In the absence of the institutions that respect the rights of minority people, almost all non burma ethnic groups started on the struggle one after another during the first democratic era of Burma. Under the current 2008 constitution, Chief Minister and state governments are selected by the central government, not by the people in their state. Laws are passed at the bicameral legislative assembly of the union. For example, like uh, the, the, the current law, current land laws and practices are threatening the traditional ownership of indigenous people, yet the legislative assembly of the union have the Burman people as majority. So even all the votes of the ethnic minority representatives combined cannot stop the law that would negatively affect the minority communities. So since last nine years, more than 13% of the Kachin population are displaced due to the ongoing fighting and development project. Now they are at risk of losing their own land in their own state. The Kachin state is richly endowed with natural resources such as jade, gold, amber, and timber. Around 90% of the old Jedi jade in the global jade market come from kitchen steak, yet indigenous people are systematically excluded from jade mining concessions. The jade contribute a large proportion of Myanmar GDP, yet kitchen steak is one of the poorest steak in the whole country. While the central government and military back companies get the most benefit from the over-exploitation of the natural resources, local populations are left with negative impacts. Just last week, on Thursday, more than 170 people, they lost their lives due to the landslides in the Jake mining area. So the conflict in the country re-escalated when the democratically elected government took office. The humanitarian aid to the displaced camps along the border are blocked by the government 
But every year, the president of Myanmar, they bestows honors and accolades to the members of the Myanmar Armed Force for their bravery in the civil war, while putting most of the human rights violation cases under the carpet. This reinforced the culture of impunity. The nationwide ceasefire process goes nowhere without any political solution. Just Therefore, just becoming a democratic country alone is not enough. The original bottom lines of the formation of the union, that is equal rights and self-determination, this principle has to be institutionalized to atone for the original sin of the cause of the conflict. Secondly, I would like to point out the minority rights issue is not just interrelated with the interstate conflict in Myanmar, but also the, related with the war and peace of the region. From Michina City, where I'm based now, it is just two hours drive to China border to the east and eight hour drive to the west to, the, to India. Myanmar share long border with India and China, and it also share long history of war and peace. The geopolitical interests of both countries and their relations impact the interstate conflict in Myanmar for decades. Both China and India supplying weapons and military equipment to Myanmar government and trying to bring Myanmar to their side. However, the Rohingya crisis has strained Myanmar relations with, West, with the West, pushing it to depend more on China for diplomatic and economic support. Driven by security concerns and economic interests, China is setting aside its non-interference principle and playing a key role in Myanmar's interest state conflict. Though China explicitly stake its interest in stability along its border, the continued frictions between Myanmar government and ethnic minorities provides China with a major source of influence over Myanmar. The conflict situation helps China to sabotage Indians' interests by supporting ethnic armed organization along Myanmar-India border. Lack of respect for minority rights. Therefore, it's the cracks in the country that make way for influence by the conflicting neighbors. Thus, it prolongs the conflict. Finally, I would like to present that, I would like to point out the current ongoing mega investments are exacerbating the conflict. Right in front of me behind this camera is the free flowing Malikanu or the ALD river, the longest river in Myanmar and life flood of more than 60% of the whole population in Myanmar. China's state power investment company is trying to resume the mega hydropower project at the headwater of this river. Beyond the river, several hundred thousand acres of lands are transformed into tissue culture, banana monocrop plantations by Chinese companies and their associates. In the west of Michino City, where I live, another Chinese company signed memorandum of understanding with the government for the exclusive industrial zone. In the north, in the ancestral land of kitchen people and watershed of the ALD River, the government gives a mining concessions of more than 300 acres of land to the Chinese proxy company. To the south, Myanmar government permits road building projects, which are parts and parcel of China-Myanmar economic corridor of the Belt and Road Initiatives. This investment have many things in common. Of course, land grabbing, lack of transparency and accountability and meaningful consultation from the current government. Despite the large in investment figures, millions, millions, billions of dollars, almost all equipment and labors are brought in from China and contribute very little to the local employment and economy. Local peoples have always experienced increased militarization in the project area which come in the name of security. And we can also experience increased human rights violations cases 
along with militarization. This project with such similar similarities are uh, exacerbating local grievances and amplifying anti-government and anti-Chinese sentiment. Thus, it prolongs the conflict. Here comes to the point that I strongly recommend the international organization to encourage the Myanmar government to keep the promise of the social contract with ethnic nationalities and strategize the effective implementation of the founding principle of equal rights and self-determination of the ethnic nationalities. Secondly, to genuinely recognize the grievances of the different minority communities and respect their rights by providing justice for the atrocity committed to the minority population. This will eventually warm up the interstate relations and leave less room for geopolitical manipulation by the conflicting neighbors. Finally, to fully implement Myanmar's sustainable development plan to apply international standards and norms to regulate large scale development projects, especially in conflict areas. This will include minority communities in decision making of issues that would affect their lives and improve social cohesion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dan, for clearly spelling out the, the case in, in Kachinan, which maybe is not as familiar internationally as um, the situation of the Rohingya. And I think you, you've highlighted a few important points. One, the interstate dimension of um, minority rights conflicts. It's quite important, particularly in the example you've given us, but in other cases as well. Uh, secondly, the issue of uh, how federalism is structured and can be formally exclusive of minority groups, even while appearing not to be. And uh, perhaps that has some resonance with the Cameroonian case we heard earlier. And finally, the issue of um, resource exploitation and land grabbing, uh, strong resonance with what Esther was telling us is happening for Afro-Colombians as well. So a common issue, it seems, across regions. So uh, if I may just pause and remind our, our global audience, we welcome your questions to any of our speakers. So please do post those on the chat and we'll have a chance shortly to hear their responses. So please do share your ideas and, and questions with us on the chat. Our next speaker is uh, Ambassador Zanier, uh, and we welcome uh, you reflecting on these cases, which of course are outside of, of your region of work, but also to reflect on related issues you are addressing in your mandate as High Commissioner on National Minorities. Please, Ambassador. Thank you very much. And yeah, I would like to explain a little bit uh, um, what we do, how we address issues. And there are so many that have been raised in the uh, uh, presentations by the by the three speakers that are very relevant and uh, uh, they raise issues that are high on, also on my agenda. First of all, my mandate. My mandate is uh, is not really a minority protection uh, mandate. It's it's a conflict prevention mandate. In recognition that conflicts, in fact, uh, uh, increasingly uh, are conflicts that uh, uh, come. Uh, uh, how can I say from from inside countries that uh, uh, their roots are. Uh, in the instability of the society. And uh, that's, of course, the starting point. And then they get complicated by geopolitics. And then you have proxies, you have external players to play a role, etc. cetera. The, the, the classical interstate conflict has, has almost disappeared. In fact, my mandate uh, was uh, developed in the beginning of the 90s when, when uh, uh, Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union uh, uh, disappeared. And, uh, and were replaced by new countries, internal administrative borders where they became international borders and they divided communities and some of them felt comfortable and, uh, and some of them started in fact, uh, 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 how can I say, reacting to, to, to this situation. And we had a number of uh, also pretty uh, nasty conflicts uh, uh, in, in all of these areas. And when, when it comes to today, we see, we see you know, ongoing conflict uh, uh, these, these days. Um, so, the, the, and of course, minority protection is very much part of and it's one of the, the most important tools that I use myself in my in my engagement. But I tend to take a broader um, a broader perspective to address this. My mandate gives me an early warning uh, 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 task uh, to, to countries when I see, in fact, the signs of uh, of instability uh, developing. 
it's based in, it's based on quiet diplomacy. So I'm uh, encouraged to go and talk a little bit to the landlord or uh, to to the people. And one of the things that I consider extremely important, and to go back to a point that Paul was raising, is is really uh, going out and and talking to the people uh, on the ground. So not only to the officials in the capital, but really traveling through the country. When I do a country visit, I go and meet with minority groups to understand also their problems, their point of view, and I always encourage dialogue between uh, governments and minorities, and very often I find that that, uh, that dialogue is, uh, is insufficient. Uh, so it needs to be, uh, uh, to be encouraged and, and, to be, uh, and to be developed and, and, and structured. Um, the the long-term uh, tool that I find uh, uh, essential uh, to address and to try to prevent this kind of conflict, however, it's, it's a long-term uh, balanced integration policy. Our societies are becoming uh, uh, increasingly diverse uh, in, a, in, a, in a global world, uh, uh, the diversity in fact is increasing everywhere. So uh, on the one hand, you have the traditional minorities, you have uh, relatively newer ones as, uh, as you know, the geopolitical situation changes, evolves, but then you also have uh, migration and that society uh, that become uh, uh, increasingly complex and this raises uh, a number of, uh, of additional issues, but also introducing, introducing elements of, uh, uh, of potential instability that need to be uh, taken into account. So I see in, in the space in which I operate, the OSC is a, how can I say, it's, it's, a, it's a European uh, organization, but which has a very, um, also their geopolitical approach to, uh, to, to geography, uh, because it also includes uh, North America and also includes Central Asia as parts of uh, one of the NATO transatlantic link and the other of the former Soviet Space. And so it, it also covers the whole uh, northern, uh, almost covers the, nor the, the whole northern hemisphere. Uh, what I see, there are two, two uh, basic trends that are uh, of concern. One is that also, uh, the, in light of the, um, how can I say, the more global challenges uh, that countries are, are facing, and we have seen, for instance, the big debates about migration and uh, uh, and, and the, the complicated issues that this has raised, especially in the, in the European Union. Um, uh, one of the things we see is uh, uh, an evolution of uh, national politics in the direction of um, uh, more conservative, uh, in some cases nationalistic, uh, if not even uh, uh, populistic policies. Uh, these policies tend to be confrontational internally. Uh, because they tend to, uh, how can I say, uh, reassure the majority, uh, but also antagonize and marginalize the minorities. Uh, so this is a context where we see a, an increasing polarization of relations with the society and the risk of, uh, of increasing instability. In some cases, then, we also see the impact of geopolitics. And, uh, and Bien was talking about the role of China and India in relation to, the, uh, to his minority there. In the OSC, I see plenty of that. Uh, there are minorities of, of you know, one country uh, residing in, in, in a neighboring country, uh, but minorities that look at what we call the king state uh, as, in fact, uh, the country with which they want to have a very close relationship. And, and uh, uh, at some point we felt that we needed to start regulating all, uh, all these things. Because, yes, the, the king state has a right, in a way, to give support in a number of areas uh, to what they... Uh, um, uh, consider as you know, uh, ethnic uh, affin uh, um, uh, a community with ethnic affinity in a neighboring country, so assisting them in various ways. But especially, I would say, in the cultural uh, field, etc., in the social assistance. But this should not complicate, and this is the limit of that. It should not complicate the process of integration of that community in the society of the country where they reside, because to me, that is really. Uh, the, the key point. And, and because of the identity politics, I see this uh, uh, integration becoming more complicated and on the two sides. Uh, sometimes governments, in fact, uh, uh, keep at, at an arm's length community minorities, uh, minority communities. Uh, on the other hand, I see minority communities that in fact do resist integration. They ask more um, uh, autonomy, in some cases self-determination. And this is also created, creating pressures that I see in many, in many directions. So how have we responded to, the, to all this? Because of course, uh, my problem also in engaging as the, a member of the international community, regional community in this case, 
um, is uh, uh, that when, when I engage, I, depending on what I say, I'm immediately portrayed as uh, siding with the government or siding with a minority against the other. Uh, so what we found very expedient is to uh, draft a set of recommendations covering the key aspects of integration policies so that I can go there with my booklet, my uh, to-do list, and I, I tick the boxes and I say, this is good, this is not, here you can improve, here I can do better. And of course, uh, in full realization that uh, there isn't a, a menu of things that are applicable everywhere, you need to adjust them to uh, uh, the historical, cultural, uh, social uh, uh, environment of every, of every place where, where, where you operate. But having a kind of a, a theoretical uh, blueprint helps you, helps you a lot. Uh, the areas that we cover in this are areas, in fact, that uh, uh, go in the direction of these policies of long-term uh, uh, balanced integration. So I start focusing on, on, on issues like education, because what, what I see is that uh, uh, in some cases, education uh, becomes a tool of uh, a divisive tool. Minorities want to learn in their own language, which is uh, their right, and it's right uh, uh, that this is uh, uh, given to them. But uh, to ensure a proper integration of the minority communities, there has to be a strong investment in teaching them the state language. Because the next step is ensuring full participation of minorities in the society and in every aspect of the public life of the country where they live. So depending also there, there are different situations. But if there is a single uh, official language in a country, it's important that also the minorities uh, have, uh, uh, they can master that language so that they can become uh, uh, parliamentarians, uh, um, uh, high level, high ranking officials uh, in the public administration and whatever. So they need to be able to uh, compete with everybody else in the society. Therefore, knowledge of state language is important, but this should not happen at the expense of their identity and the expense of, uh, um, uh, of, of, the, of their own uh, cultural background. Uh, so the, the balance there is difficult to achieve, but there is a path uh, leading in that direction. What I'm seeing today, and this is the new uh, thing on which I'm working, is that uh, um, uh, uh, divisions uh, that, that in fact are related also to education are, uh, are creating also uh, and are becoming more controversial in the society. The debate about symbols, for instance, statues, and the interpretation of history in general. And I'm working with a group of historians on this thing. Um, uh, th there is something in history I find it very interesting that is called the mirror of pain and pride, as the historians call it. And um, you, may, you may even not. not need to dispute historical facts, uh, but history is related to identity. And uh, uh, you can look at history in different ways depending on who you are and where you sit. For some, uh, a historical event is a great victory. For others, the same event uh, is a tragedy, is, uh, is a major defeat. Uh, so if, if this is uh, celebrated by the majority as a great victory and we should mark this moment, etc., the minority present there if they were the, were the ones on the other side, they will suffer. They will feel alienated. They won't really participate in this event. So you need also to uh, include a kind of a multi-perspectivity uh, in, uh, in history and, and try to bring in also the, the perspective of the others. And I've seen examples where this doesn't really work. Uh, and, uh, and it's often uh, along uh, you know, the, the lines of geopolitical division. Um, communities uh, in the Baltic states, for instance, but also in the former Yugoslavia. If you go to Bosnia and Herzegovina, they still have uh, uh, schools that have, uh, um, uh, how can I say, different schools under a single roof. So it looks good because all students go there. But then if you belong to a certain ethnic group, you study with your group of people and you study a certain version of history as well. And, and if you are with the other group, you study a different version. And when you finish, uh, the, 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 uh, you get out and go to university, you have a very different understanding of what history and interpretation of what history of the country where you learn to. You tend to look at the other group as a competitor, if not really as, uh, as an enemy or an opponent to be somehow confronted. Uh, so this will not make a society uh, uh, more functional. So education, language, and participation are key, are key aspects of this. Uh, rule of law, uh, extremely important. Uh, the police, we have recommendations on police. Uh, operating in multi-ethnic environment, uh, you want to have a police that reflects the diversity of the society, uh, first of all. So the composition, first of all, of the police 
should be such that it really reflects all the components of the society. I heard what Esther was saying about uh, groups that <coughs> look, uh, the, the, the ethnic groups that set up their own protection mechanism. And that's something that I, uh, that really shows the failure of the state uh, because that's a responsibility of the state to provide security to everybody and to ensure that they feel part of the police. Also because the police will become more efficient if it includes uh, representatives of all uh, parts of the society. Uh, uh, because uh, if you don't trust the policeman because he belongs to a different ethnic group and is not, you don't feel he's one of yours, then the, the police will not be effective. They won't really be able to pick up the signals that they need to fight uh, uh, crime and to be, to be effective also in uh, uh, assuring protection to, to everybody in the society. And, and we've seen it also in, uh, how can I say, in developed uh, and advanced societies in the NC sphere, uh, that if you don't do that, you may find yourself with a big problem in your, uh, in your hands. And the same applies to justice, it's exactly the same principle. The media, the access to media and the, and the role of digital media, we're seeing now in COVID and the latest recommendations and issues that to do with COVID and minorities. Um, we have seen uh, media, in fact, uh, digital, me uh, digital media and, and, uh, and social media used uh, often uh, to uh, 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 spread the discrimination, if not racism, and, uh, and blame often minority communities that have been uh, appointed as, uh, as you know, a big problem in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, contagion and then promote and, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, how can I say, being part of, uh, being part of the, of the of the problem rather than uh, needing, needing uh, particular attention and needing particular protection. So there has been discrimination that we have uh, uh, seen widespread. And, and by the way, uh, a point that was raised on the, uh, the role of women, uh, on COVID in particular, we saw examples of double or triple, triple discrimination uh, with women being frontline workers in many and providing essential services in uh, hospitals, uh, or in, in, in many areas of, uh, uh, of uh, and, and, and minorities more broadly, and from transport to agriculture to whatever. Uh, at the same time, minorities suffering from the closure of borders, often they're located uh, close to borders, borders have been closed, and so they lost economic uh, uh, opportunities. So we have seen uh, this discrimination in many, in many areas, and we are issuing now, we have issued, in fact, recommendations to country uh, to take a good look at it. The final point I would uh, make, and I would go uh, back to the point that, that Paul had raised initially. Um, it is important, and unfortunately, I wish there were uh, more, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, international uh, actors that, have, that, that, uh, that understand this, uh, this problem. Conflict prevention is still too traditional, and we're still focused on, uh, on uh, interstate relations. It really needs to be rethought. And, and I find it, from my perspective, I find it very useful to have this mandate that allows me to look into the societies and to look at what, and to understand what are the problems that on a, on a longer term uh, may uh, create, uh, uh, create a conflict. Uh, and, and so I started a series of, uh, of events in New York. First, I want to inform everybody about the experiences and, and the, uh, the methodology that we have developed in the, uh, in the USC and, and brought a number of regional organizations, but also uh, UNDP, UNICEF, and other uh, key uh, um, agency of the agency of the UN to share with them uh, what we do to show them what we are. We are not really in the process of uh, uh, you know telling people what to do, but certainly, and this is where I am very glad to uh, to work with Pernau because Pernau is a little bit a platform that allows me also to communicate and inform others about our own uh, methodology, the way uh, and the way we address these uh, these things and things. Uh, I'm grateful to him also for using me uh, often in, in this, uh, in this uh, But certainly we're still, we still have a problem. I still remember at the beginning, actually before the beginning of the conflict in Donbass, I went to Brussels for discussions with the EU uh, because my uh, understanding was that uh, uh, there was a, a, a big potential of instability in Eastern Ukraine. And the answer from the EU leadership in a way was not worried, it's under control, we're working with the Ukrainians, uh, they were giving them uh, strong support, nothing will happen. Uh, and that was an, a typical example of a readout from a situation from the capital. 
and they really didn't have the terminals down in Donbass and periphery uh, to pick up the data without wanting to define the nature of the conflict, which is very controversial today. But, uh, uh, but uh, ignoring uh, or not being able to pick up the size of, uh, of this, I think it was a major failure for the international community. And then we had to, in a way, run after the crisis rather than trying to do everything we could. Thank you very much, Ambassador Zanier, for those insights from, from your mandate and your work on balanced integration, as you call it. And, and uh, certainly your mandate has been very progressive and productive in producing objective recommendations on these issues. But I think also your talk reminds us of the subjective nature of integration and the importance of listening to minority com communities and how they understand what integration really would mean for them. So uh, with that, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Fran de Varen to share his reflections on the very important cases we've heard today. Fernand. Thank you, Corinne. Hello, everyone. I'd like first to congratulate the Tom Lantos Institute and the Human Rights Consortium of the University of London for, well, for this, for organizing a very successful series of webinars on debating challenges for minority protection including this final one on conflict prevention and minorities. So um, I'd also like to express my appreciation for the rich contributions of the expert speakers, Dan and Paul, as well as to acknowledge the valued participation and the insights uh, today that the USC High Commissioner on National Minorities, Ambassador Zanier, just shared with us. Now, as some of you know, uh, conflict prevention and protection of the human rights of minorities is a thematic priority of my mandate. And it'll also be the focus of a number of regional forums, hopefully next year, in different parts of the world, uh, pandemic permitting, of course. And in addition, uh, next year's forum on minority issues in Geneva uh, in November 2021 will also be on this extremely topical uh, theme. Um, I'll also be presenting in 2021, by the way, a report on conflict prevention, inclusion of minorities, and the protection of their human rights. So the main observation I have is on the key point which stands out from what um, I heard uh, from the uh, guest speakers um, by describing the drift towards conflict in different countries. And that's what I retain, and that's the marginalization, the extent the, of the disproportionate exclusion of minorities and long uh, unaddressed grievances were, I think, among the main push factors, but not the only ones, obviously, but these were the main push factors down the path of eventual violence and conflict. Now, violence around the world, where you have a situation where it drifts into a conflict, usually coalesces around grievances. People don't naturally hate their neighbors instinctively or automatically. But what we're seeing, I think, is that hate and intolerance can create fertile grounds for tensions that can also lead uh, to conflict. I wanted to also raise or to emphasize another point. And I think Ambassador Zanier uh, mentioned it in passing also. Most of the world's conflicts today, uh, and this is suggested by research, but most of the conflicts today, around three quarters, are intrastate, domestic, internal conflicts. Um, and most of these involve minorities. Minorities that claim exclusion and um, denigration, that their identity is threatened or ignored, and that they are excluded or discriminated in terms of access to employment, education, economic uh, opportunities, land ownership and control over resources and even uh, grievances around not being able to participate in and contribute to public um, affairs. Uh, if the state, in other words, and I think I also heard this, if the state doesn't reflect the reality of society, including the presence of minorities, you have a background where people will feel left out and not represented fairly. So what I retain from uh, the presentations is that inequality along ethnic, religious, or linguistic lines against minority communities breeds resentment, frustration, anger, and potentially conflict. Although I want to also react to one comment I heard, 
It's not poverty itself, by the way, that, that causes conflict. We have to get rid of this, this uh, chimera. It's when you have poverty, which can be identified along ethnic lines, for example. If inequality is perpetuated along ethnic or linguistic lines, then longstanding unaddressed grievances create the fertile ground for the use of violence, violent means, if there's no legitimate or effective means to address these, these grievances effectively. So I wanted to emphasize how much this is consistent with the main conclusions of the, and I want to emphasize this point, the, the first ever joint report between the United Nations and the World Bank on preventing conflicts. It was published in 2017. And it, it actually expressed the main point that many, if not most of today's conflicts relate to grievances, grievances by especially minorities arising from economic, political, or social inequality, exclusion, and feelings of injustice that remain unaddressed over time. And that these grievances then can become politicized and that's where you risk tipping into violence. I think it's quite clearly scientifically demonstrated, but I don't think we actually refer to this or explore this area sufficiently. Um, but unfortunately, as Dan and Esther, I think also pointed out, hate speech and tolerance and racism can normalize the exclusion of minorities within a society. And this can create the preconditions of stigmatizing minorities as somehow alien or dangerous or other as a threat perhaps even uh, towards the majority population. So that violence against minorities sometimes unfortunately becomes almost a normal, normal result to however longstanding or peacefully, however longstanding or peacefully uh, minor minorities might try to uh, voice their grievances. So I think it seems clear to me from these presentations, and I would add also that as we heard in the, by, in the very nature of the High Commissioner's mandate as a conflict prevention mechanism, that this illustrates pretty well the interrelationship between conflicts and the human rights of minorities and the promotion of inclusiveness. It is by directly addressing inequality and the discriminatory exclusion of minorities that you tackle the root causes of many, maybe not all, but many, perhaps even most of today's violent conflicts. Uh, to put that a bit differently, um, it's usually by addressing uh, the social, economic and political grievances of minorities, often connected to breaches of their human rights, including the prohibition of discrimination, but also participation rights and even in some cases, community or autonomy guarantees. It's by addressing all of this that you look at uh, weakening, if you will, one of the main drivers of conflicts. And it gives an opportunity for more inclusive measures for minorities to participate fully in society and perhaps also have uh, the legal and political measures and guarantees in place for a more balanced and inclusive society against otherwise dangerous forms of inequality and exclusion. So um, what came out also uh, from, from the presentations, uh, which has to be made perhaps as clear as possible is that most of the world's conflicts involving minorities doesn't just appear out of thin air. Almost all of them emerge because of a long, this long period of unaddressed grievances of exclusion and discrimination. Now, these may be exploited by internal or external actors. We, we heard that also. But fundamentally, I would say they all go back to one key point. Minorities are excluded. And when you say excluded, this would normally mean that their human rights, for example, the prohibition of discrimination on the basis of language, religion, or ethnicity, amongst others, have not been respected for a very long period of time. This was, I think, particularly obvious for from the examples in Myanmar and Cameroon, but we could have used other examples in Europe, for example, in the case of North Macedonia, or in Asia, in the case with uh, Sri Lanka, where you had issues such as the language of the Albanian and Tamil minorities in education, 
their relative and discriminatory exclusion from civil service positions and other opportunities, all of these were central to the eventual eruption of violence after a long period of claims and trying to use whatever legal and political uh, recourses they had for their what is fundamentally, I think, the protection of their human rights. So this is the link that is sometimes missed in some of the analysis on the interrelationship between conflicts, the human rights of minorities, and the promotion of inclusiveness and stability. So there are a number of things that can be done better. Uh, these have been mentioned, I think, by uh, all of, of the speakers, though I'd like to once again emphasize the fundamental dimension of identifying the nature of the stresses that can lead to conflict. And this is for essentially the breaches of the human rights of minorities in order to address the root causes of conflicts, which are often misunderstood or misdiagnosed, even by international organizations. Just very quickly, I can tell you that at the United Nations in New York, I had an interesting conversation with a, a very high level UN official who told me that in relation to Cameroon, there's no minority issue. The Anglophones are not a minority in Cameroon. That was quite an interesting comment from a, once again, a very high level official of the United Nations involved in this area to say in a certain way. So it's also a challenge uh, with the United Nations, with in international organizations, who can be disconnected from minority issues um, and who, as we heard, often uh, operate on the periphery or mainly in capitals of states and do not look at the situation perhaps of minorities in a more perif uh, periphery. So conflict prevention and peace depend on justice for minorities. And that means effectively addressing uh, inequalities, racism and exclusion. So, Speaking of them by the wines, I think. So I'd like to express once again my gratitude to the Tom Lantos Institute and the Human Rights Consortium of the University of London for this impressive webinar series. And thanks also my gratitude to all of the speakers who have enlightened us on issues of conflict in Cameroon, Colombia, and Myanmar, and of course the High Commissioner Lanier, Zanier, and everyone again for this uh, this uh, interesting and very topical area of discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernand. It's, uh, it's great to hear that you'll be continuing to look closely at this in your mandate in the coming years. And I think your summary has underscored uh, that minority rights protection is central to what's been called upstream conflict prevention, uh, highlighting how, how central these, these issues are to so many conflicts in the world. But I think a key message also that we want to combat is that minority rights, or sorry, minority groups and diversity are a threat to state stability, because unfortunately in many states, there's still this idea that diversity itself is a threat. And so we see these aggressive assimilation policies that just serve to aggravate grievance and conflict. And that's a message we certainly would want to combat by bringing attention to minority rights. So I would like to turn now back to all of our um, presenters and to, to have a question, a round of questions. I think time is short, so we'll have time for one question each. And uh, I'd like to begin with Paul, <coughs> excuse me. Paul, speaking of the issue of identity expression, um, in your experience in Cameroon, can the, can the pressure of the conflict in fact be so intense as to make members of the minority groups wish to, to shed or, or in fact hide their identity traits or to, to disassociate with their identity for fear of, of the retribution that comes with that. And can you comment on if that's happening in Cameroon? Thanks for the question. It is a, it is a palpable problem, um, not least because in Cameroon's context, the Anglophone, Francophone, um, distinction is considered as a, or is often labeled as a foreign distinction, meaning that this is the product of uh, colonial experience. Um, Cameroonians 100 years or 250 years ago were not predominantly English speaking or predominantly French speaking. This occurred from a colonial encounter. Uh, that said, it is the world and the society in which they live and 
these two systems determine their access to education, to justice, to employment, to participate in public affairs and so on. And so if they aren't treated equally, uh, they, they produce problems. So yes, indeed, um, I think in the, in the Cameroonian context, if you have a state policy that very um, firmly wishes to do away with a distinction, then with all the tools and instruments that the state has, it may in fact lead some people opportunistically to think, well, you know, maybe if I shed um, you know, if I could kind of bypass or go around um, this uh, distinction, you know, maybe I'll increase my chances. Um, one should also not discount, and, and I, we're seeing some signals of this as well in Cameroon, that governments may actually, um, given enough time, it may be, they may be able to do some level of social engineering. That is, what if, you know, we, what if the vision of the country in the future is that we'd like to mix the population a little more. That is, we don't want people who see themselves as territorially linked to regions as Anglophone. We want, we want them sort of more geographically dispersed across the country. And governments wield enormous resources to do that. I mean, if they target populations, you know, say in the age group of 15 to 20, when people are going into university. And then if you create the right set of incentives, you can actually put enough pressure. Um, again, depending on the mix of factors, you know, whether it's a language or ethnic or religion, that's holding a group together. Um, but yes, in the Cameroonian space, and again, conflict is conflict creates displacement. There's hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced from those regions. And most of them so have been displaced from the predominantly Anglophone into the predominantly Francophone regions. And they have to get on with life. And getting on with life sometimes means that you have to shed off uh, the, the, um, the trait that is the distinguishing trait for the minority group. So it is a palpable issue and, um, and, and conflict exacerbates it. And I think that uh, we, we need to pay attention to that as well. Thank you very much, Paul, for the insights into those dynamics, which are which are yeah, very sad to hear that individuals would have to to shed their identity in that in that way. Uh, I'd like to turn now to Esther. Uh, Esther, you briefly mentioned in your presentation the impact of COVID nineteen, but I wonder if we could come back to that. And what would you say are the additional challenges that uh, minority communities in the region are facing in the context of this pandemic? Mm. Um, yeah, so the impact of COVID-19, um, Colombia, I, I'm, I don't have the exact figures today on, on how, how many cases there are at the moment, but the, the Colombian cases of COVID have been this, uh, kind of decidedly less than perhaps um, what we've seen in Europe and what we've seen in North America. I think the, the figures of cases are around five or 6,000 and the figures of um, Sorry, not five or six thousand, but the, the figures of um, of people who have died from COVID are um, around two thousand, maybe reaching up to three. But what from the beginning of this pandemic, what we knew in Colombia is that the risks that it would create, particularly for the Pacific region and the region affected by the armed conflict. Um, where I work at the moment in Buena Ventura, for example, um, because of all of those structural historical um, factors that I mentioned in my presentation, um, there is a lack of health services, there's a lack of um, basic sanitation. Most homes don't even have 24-hour uh, running water, so we're hearing all of this advice from the World Health Organization and, and beyond around <laughs> washing our hands um, with, with no running water. So those, those communities are already extremely vulnerable to, to a health um, pandemic like what we're seeing at the moment. But in terms of the armed conflict, it has exacerbated the situation of armed conflict. So many of the communities, for example, around, around the rural regions of Buenaventura um, were already living in situations of what we call confinement because of the actions of armed groups. Um, 
So when uh, the social distancing and the lockdowns were put in place, communities found themselves doubly confined. Um, most or a large proportion of people work informally, so they don't have, um, you know, job security. Most, a lot of people survive day to day basis. So this has exacerbated um, poverty and access to food. Um, but what has also happened is that in this situation, this complex situation, um, armed groups have been able to take advantage of, of the situation. So um, we have seen an increase in forced displacement. We've seen an increase in confinements. We've seen an increase in actions by armed groups in territories. One of the key concerns for CODES where I work is that social leaders who often have um, protection, protection schemes, which are provided by the government. So those who are human rights activists and um, social leaders have protection schemes. Many of those schemes have been reduced in the context of the pandemic. So they're even more exposed to the dangers of um, these threats from armed groups. And we've even seen in some cases, um, sorry, I hope you can't hear my baby crying. We've even seen in some cases, um, communities being stigmatized by armed groups for suspected cases of COVID. So I, I, we saw one case where a woman who was a social leader was actually stigmatized and threatened for having COVID. So that, that's, that's left kind of people who are already vulnerable to more stigmatization. Thank you very much, Esther, for sharing those uh, additional impacts on the, the Afro-Colombian com community. It's very striking what you've what you relayed to us. Um, I'd like to now turn to to Dan. Dan, can you tell us a bit more um, about the role of civil society organizations in minority rights and conflict in Myanmar from your point of view? Since the last 10 years, nine years, many civil society organizations come up from the ethnic minority community. Uh, many good things come with these civil society organizations and challenges. But let me point out one good thing. Because of the ethno, increased ethno-nationalism among the ethnic minorities group, social cohesions among different ethnic groups also reduce over the time. And when some one ethnic group suffer, the rest of the country, they do not know what is happening in that part of country. For example, when current people are suffering, nobody know, nobody support. But some, and then when the Rohingya people suffer, so people here, uh, they hardly know Rohingya. They may just heard about Bengali or Gala or uh, illegal migrants, something like that. The thing is that they have little access to the proper information. Most of the state and private media, they just use the word Bengali instead of the word Rohingya. So people, they have some kind of like blackout. In those kind of cases, the civil society organizations and ethnic uh, media, they jump into that gap and they, they translate into their languages, and then they inform the, what is going on in the country. And then the so, so the thing is that the challenge among the minority is that so the lack of social cohesion among minority groups. When we look at the bigger picture in the country, the minorities are not necessarily minority. In China, the 55 minority groups may be very much minority compared to the Han majority population. But in Myanmar, that when we combine all the minority groups together, it is more than 40 or 50. So very important, very important that we, we need to come together. So when minority groups come together, it will no longer be a minority uh, for the majority group. So the civil society organization in this country now they are trying to build relationship, build, trying to uh, con co organize exchange, culture exchange, yes or exchange, so much so they can work together, they can build alliance to advocate for environment justice, social justice and economic justice. So important role. 
Thank you very much for those examples. And, and uh, I was doing some research. I think your own college, uh, Kachinland College, has been doing intercultural work as well. So that, that's excellent. And we hope you'll be able to continue with that. So we have a um, next question to uh, Ambassador Zanya. We have a question from the audience um, concerning the situation in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, the, this question is uh, asking one month ago, there was the 10 years anniversary of the inter-ethnic conflict in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, could you please reflect on why efforts of the international community to ensure the accountability for those crimes, truth seeking and reconciliation failed? Uh, Ambassador Zandi, would you like to add your comments on that question, please? Yes, with, with pleasure. Uh, actually, truth and reconciliation, uh, in my view, has to come from uh, within the society. It is really difficult to impose it from, from outside. Of course, you can, uh, you can raise these issues and, as, you know, uh, my meetings with the, the Kyrgyz leaders, the top leaders of Kyrgyzstan, uh, a number of times I raised, for instance, the Ashkara case, where I see that these incidents are still looked, uh, uh, looked at and, uh, you know, through the spectacles of uh, law enforcement and criminalization somehow. And, uh, um, and, and there is, how can I say, not enough understanding of the, uh, uh, of the causes of, uh, uh, of this. Uh, now, the, there is a president who uh, used to be the uh, governor of the Osh region, which was very much at the center of these, uh, of these things. So there, there, there could be a better opportunity uh, uh, to, to review this, uh, this policy. Uh, the, part of the problem in terms of inter-ethnic relations in South Kyrgyzstan uh, was that they were also influenced by the relations between the countries, between Kyrgyzstan and the United States, so this was a, a different community. And uh, um, now uh, the, the relations have, uh, uh, have improved very significantly the last, uh, over the last two, three years. Uh, borders are open, so there is trade developing, uh, the, uh, the minority is benefiting from that. So this is creating a different atmosphere. So uh, if there is a political will, I think the conditions to try to go down that road of uh, uh, really talking about what happened and uh, uh, and uh, recognizing, uh, uh, apologizing, and reconciling, they're all difficult steps, but I think there is a better opportunity today, so we should continue to, to engage with them. But this is one of those cases where you need to work on both sides. We in South Kyrgyzstan, for instance, we have a, a rather large pro program of multilingual education where we engage the, uh, uh, the, the Uzbek community to uh, uh, help them integrate better. It, it's a community that is not well integrated. Uh, on the Kyrgyz side, however, you go there and look at the police and you see the police is, as we were discussing earlier, uh, is, is basically ethnic Kyrgyz police uh, operating in uh, uh, Uzbek ethnic neighborhoods. So that doesn't work either. Um, so th there is a need, on the other hand, that the Uzbeks refuse to, uh, to do their military service in the, in the Kyrgyz army. So there are, there are problems on both sides and you need to uh, recognize them and you need to start somewhere and you need to start with, a, with an open dialogue. This is where I think the leadership uh, of Kyrgyzstan has a particular responsibility and I haven't seen enough effort uh, to, to make it happen. So we should continue uh, pushing them. But the failure, and I wouldn't say that it's a failure of the international community because I think the international community sees that. It, it's really more a failure of, uh, uh, of the society itself and all groups in the society in really, uh, you know, uh, um, making a, a very, convinced effort uh, to try to overcome this situation rather than just uh, keep uh, 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 sticking to, to the old ways and then, you know, carrying on as if uh, nothing had happened and just recriminating about the situation. Thank you so much, your reflections on that particular case. Um, I'd like to, to give Esther the floor just briefly because she got caught off uh, <laughs> urgently attending to her child's needs. So Esther, please, you want to make a final point. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I just had to cut off uh, quickly. Just to, I wanted to correct, and I mentioned the number of cases in co in Colombia of, of COVID. We've actually got now um, 4,500 people who have died from the um, virus. Um, so I just wanted to correct that. But I just also wanted to make a final reflection on thinking about some of the words of the special rapporteur. What we really want to emphasize here in the case of Colombia, that this is not an ethnic conflict. 
as I mentioned at the beginning. So the conflict doesn't arise from grievances of ethnic minorities. Ethnic minorities are victims of the armed conflict. And I know there's a lot of discussion around the word or the use of the word victim, but we really often use that a lot here because we understand that this conflict is, is it belongs to other parties. And Afro-descendant people and indigenous people have been victimized by all of that violence and by those you know, interests in, in their territories. And so that really then um, really puts a lot of emphasis on the importance again of participation of, of ethnic minorities in truth processes and in transitional justice, because it's through those truth processes that we're able to really reveal the true nature of this armed conflict. And even in the cases where uh, minority people, so Af Afro-descendant people and indigenous people have been part of various different armed groups in the conflict, we still see those people as victims of a wider dynamic of those wider structural um, inequalities and the historical um, factors that have led towards the conflict. And even in many cases, the, the forced recruitment of people into those armed groups. So I think that in the case of Colombia, it's, it's really important to kind of understand that that dynamic is perhaps slightly different to other, other contexts when we're talking about um, minorities and armed conflict and understanding their role as victims, but as important change agents also for being able to um, foster, uh, foster peace and transitional justice. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. I think that's a really important point and a good one to, to end on in terms of understanding minority groups as change agents for peace. And I think all of our speakers have really illustrated that very strongly today, not only by your personal interventions, but also the mandates that you support. And uh, with that, I would, I would like to, to bring our session to a close. Uh, thank you very much for your, your ideas and your time today. Uh, I hope that all of you, given that you're working on ongoing conflict situations, will be able to work with, uh, with Fernanda Varen and, and the Special Rapporteur's mandate going forward in, in support of the justice that you are seeking for minority communities in those contexts. Um, thank you also to the team at Tom Lantos Institute behind the scenes, especially Sean Waller and Evelyn Verhash, who have been supporting us today. Uh, the videos of all three of our webinars will be available on the websites, the YouTube uh, page, and the Facebook page of the Tom Lantos Institute, and in the video archives of the School of Advanced Study. As well, they'll be posted on a specially created website on the forum, minorityforum.info, which uh, also offers a searchable database of all the statements made to the forum on minority issues. Um, and I would like to, we've had a comment here from our co-host, uh, Anna Maria Biro, who's the director of Tom Lantos Institute, reminding us that whether at home or transnationally, practice shows that minority solidarity pays off. And I hope that this webinar series has been an example, a positive example of minority solidarity and, and transnational cooperation on these issues. And uh, I hope that uh, all of you will be able to continue your excellent work uh, in seeking uh, security, peace, and justice for minority groups globally. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending and for our audience as well. Good day. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.